Hello, everyone. Today I'm going to read from you from the American Democracy, pages 206 to 209, pulled straight from chapter 8. Here goes. Today's party alignment and its origins. A party realignment gradually loses strength as the issues that gave rise to it decline in importance. By the late 1960s, with the Democratic Party divided over the Vietnam War and civil rights, it was apparent that the era of New Deal politics was ending. The changes were most dramatic in the South. The region had been solidly democratic at all levels since the Civil War, but the Democratic Party's leadership on civil rights alienated white conservatives. In the 1964 presidential election, five southern states voted Republican, an indicator that it, of what was to come. Today, today, the Republican Party dominates presidential voting in the South and holds most of the region's top elected positions. More slowly and less completely, the northeastern states have become increasingly democratic. This shift is attributed in part to the declining influence of the Republican Party's moderate wing, which was concentrated in this region. As Southern conservatives came to dominate Republican politics, the party's stance on social issues such as abortion and affirmative action tilted towards the right, reducing the party's appeal in the Northeast. The net result of these changes has been a remaking of the party landscape. Some analysts describe it as a realignment, albeit a slow and fitful one. Rather than occurring abruptly in response to a disruptive issue, as was the case in the 1860s, 1890s, and 1930s realignments, the change took place gradually and is pro the product of several issues rather than an overriding disruptive one. But the culminative result, a reshuffling of the party's coalitions and platforms, is like that of previous realignments. In effect, America's parties have realigned without going through the sudden shock of a realigning election. Initially, the GOP, short for Grand Old Party, and another name, the Republican Party, gained the most from the change. In the decades following, since the 1930s, Great Depression, the GOP was decidedly the weaker party. Since 1960. Eight. However, Republicans have held the presidency for roughly twice as many years as the Democrats and have controlled one or both houses of Congress more than a third of that time. However, the Republican Party has not duplicated the success that Advantage Party had in its realignments of 1860s, 1890s, and 1930s, partly because of missteps by two of its presidents. After winning the presidency in 1968 and 1972, Republican Richard Nixon became embroiled in the Watergate affair and was forced to resign, the first and only president to do so. The Republicans lost a huge number of congressional seats in the 1974 midterm election and did not recover the lost ground until the 1980s. After the 2000 election, the GOP for the first time in a half century held the presidency in both houses of Congress. However, President George W. Bush's decision to invade Iraq in 2003 proved increasingly unpopular contributing to his party's loss of the House and the Senate in the 2006 midterm elections, and its loss of the presidency in the 2008 election. The Iraq conflict also undermined Republicans' hopes of capturing Americans' party loyalties. After trailing the Democrats for years, the Republicans, by 2004, had narrowed the gap. Democratic Party identifiers barely outnumbered Republican identifiers. As discontent with Iraq grew, though, the trend toward the GOP reversed itself. In 2010, however, Republicans gained ground as the public soared on the performance of President Obama, soured on the performance of President Obama and the Democratic Congress. Analysts differ in their judgment on where the party system is heading in the long run. Some predict a period of Republican resurgence once the GOP is able to refocus the public attention on the issues such as taxes that worked for it before the Iraq War derailed its momentum. Others foresee a strong Democratic Party fueled by the increased voting power of Hispanics and young adults who lean Democratic. In the 2008 election, presidential election, the Democrats won about two-thirds of the Hispanic vote and nearly that proportion of the vote among those under 30 years of age. If these groups remain loyal to the Democratic Party, it could achieve a lengthy period of dominance. Although the party's setback in 2010 
congressional election raises questions about the possibility. One thing about the future is virtually certain. As they have since 1860, Americans will continue to look to the Republican and Democratic parties for political leadership. The enduring strength and the appeal of the two major parties is a constant feature of American politics. Parties and the Vote The power of a party is at no time clearer than when, election after election, the Republican and Democratic candidates reap the vote of their party's identifiers. In the 2008 presidential election, John McCain had the support of more than 85% of Republican Party identifiers, while Barack Obama garnered the votes of more than 85% of self-identified Democrats. Major party candidates do not always do that well with party loyalists, but it is relatively rare. In congressional races as well as in pres the presidential race, for a party nominee to gain get less than 80% of the partisan vote. Even independent voters are less independent than might be assumed. When Americans are asked in polls if they are a Republican, a Democrat, or an Independent, about a third say they are independents. However, in the follow-up question that asks if they lean towards the Republican Party or towards the Democratic Party, about two in three independents say they lean towards one of the parties. Most of these independents vote in the direction they lean. In recent presidential elections, more than 8 in 10 lean leaners have backed the candidate of the party towards which they lean. Less than 15% of all voters are true to independents in the sense that party loyalty pays little to no part in the votes they cast. The power of party loyalties is evident in the extent to which straight ticket voting occurs. Candidates for the presidency and Congress run separately, but voters do not treat them that way. Most voters who cast a ballot for the Republican presidential candidates also vote for the Republican congressional candidate in their district. The same is true on the Democratic side. Less than 20% of voters cast a split ticket, voting for one party's presidential candidate and then voting for the other party's congressional candidate. For a period in the 1970s, when dissatisfaction with both parties was widespread, split ticket voting occurred at nearly twice its current level. Analysts describe this development as dealignment, a movement of voters away from a strong party attachments. The dealignment thesis has become less persuasive as a result of the increase in party line voting in recent elections. Electoral and party systems. Throughout nearly all of its history, the United States has had a two-party system. Federalists versus Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans, Whig versus Democrats, Republicans versus Democrats. A two-party system, however, is the exception rather than the rule. More democra democracies have a multi-party system in which three or more parties have the capacity to gain control of the government, separately or in coalition. Why the difference? Why are there three or more major parties in most democracies, but only two parties in the United States? Now, I know I'm going on to 210 here. I'm sorry I lied to you, but let's see how much there is. Actually, that's all. All right. It's been a pleasure reading for you. Have a nice time.